So with that, let me ask how many of you are entrepreneurs who are starting or who are starting or who are doing um, a startup in EDA market, electronic design automation software market? Anyone? All right. So how many of you are entrepreneurs who are doing any new companies right now? Or how many of you are, oh, that's good, how many of, almost one third, how many of you are planning to start a startup and looking for money? Oh, there are a few of them. I think, uh, you know, you might want to grab hold of um, Rajiv at the end of the talk because he's a very active investor as well before he leaves, so make sure. And, you know, we have, we have made sure here no one can get out other than that small area from there. So just stand there right before he gets out. And so, <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's a great opportunity for you to meet with Rajiv. So um, most of the entrepreneurs, you know, focus in on creating one successful company. But there are many of them who not only create first one as a big success, but continue to do so. This is what Rajiv has been doing for the last two decades. Not only he um, founded Magma Design Automation back in um, 98 after selling his earlier EDA automation software company, Ambit, to Cadence, but took it public as well as grew it into the fourth largest EDA software company in the world. In 2001, it was um, listed in NASDAQ, and then it was ranked as the second fastest growing technology company in 2005 by Forbes. Magma was acquired in 2012 by Synopsys, which is again, I guess, one of the top three probably, the automation EDA software company that tells you that I'm not from the EDA market. So, and prior to founding Magma and Ambit, he also co-founded and served as director of Logic Vision, which also went public and was acquired by Mentor Graphics, which is another EDA um, software company, I think based in Oregon, right? And at the, at the same time, he was also instrumental in creating a number of other startups like GeoSoft, which was acquired by Synopsys, Auto ESL, which was acquired by Jiling. So you can, if you want to learn about EDA, it tells you that so many companies in that space, Rajiv is the man. So make sure you get hold of him if you want to do something, and I'm sure he'll have a lot of good ideas as well. At the same time, he's won a number of awards, including um, you know recipient of Red Herring, a top innovator, 2002 Lifetime Achievement Award by his school in India and many others. At the same time, he's an active angel investor in a number of companies currently he's involved with. With that, I would like to invite him to share his colorful, amazing, and exciting entrepreneurial journey with us this evening. So let's give him a big, big round of applause. So first off, I wanted to uh, thank Naveen for the introduction, but I'm actually not doing anything in EDA and chip design. So if any of you come with that, uh, I, I really have left the field two and a half years ago, haven't looked at it, uh, have sort of stayed away from, from that field because I want to learn something new every few years. And it was a godsend opportunity to be able to do that. And I've taken that up and I've done that very, very actively, both as an in investor and what I call parallel entrepreneurism that I'm trying to do today. But my speech today is about, you know, I mean, Naveen asked me to talk about building serially a set of companies and what it takes to do that. And he said, what's the magic of doing that? I wanted to start with myself before, I mean, I come from a family which is in India, in, uh, you know, my dad was an Indian Revenue Service. Any interest in business was, you know, zero to negative in my house. Every time I changed jobs, my mom would get worried that he's going from 10,000 employees to 800 employees to he's by himself. He just can't keep a job. <laughs> that was the whole concept with which she operated. So I come from no background. My only experience with entrepreneurism while I was in India was when I was in high school uh, in, in grade 10. I ran a comic book, you know, we used to take a school bus, it's about 25 kilometers of school bus ride. So I get about 40 minutes to an hour where people are, are in my bus. And you know, my dad said, I won't buy you comics. This was Amar Chitra Kata, Tintin, you know, Asterix, different levels of comics. He just refused to buy comics to me. 
So what I did was I got a few of them that my cousins had given me the money for, and I would rent it out for 25 cents, uh, 25 paisa for Amar Chitragada, 50 paisa for uh, Tintin, you know, different things at different prices thing. And pretty soon my backpack was like full of comics. So I, I'm carrying this in, 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 in my school bus and I'm renting it for, for money. And I hired two other kids. So we had three people all carrying all the comic books and in, 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 we were making good money. We were collecting a lot of things. But in grade 10, as I you know, graduated into grade 10, one of the problems that happened was I was a scrawly little four feet, eight inch kid. You know, I'm a very small, lean, and a little guy. So the, all the big guys refused to pay me. <laughs> so they had run up a tab and we had big cash collection issues. So people were you know, 30 rupees, 50 rupees owing to me. I had no way to collect the money. So I struck a deal with uh, you know, the biggest guy in, in my bus, whose name was PC Matthew. I still remember him very actively because he was like six foot, really big guy. And the deal was every comic he gets to read first. I bring it to him. He does the collection for me. <laughs> right? So I still remember we, I mean, uh, in school bus, he's trying to collect with somebody. He's got somebody by the, <laughs> you know, lifted up and he's collecting the money. And right in behind us was a principal of the, of the school. So we got busted, you know, and getting busted in India at that time means getting caned, suspended and getting caned. I mean, a lot of my, my kids are like, really do they do that? Yeah, I got really caned. In the assembly, I had to get caned, got suspended from the bus. For one year, my commute time went up by another half an hour. I had to take a private bus and go to school. So any interest again in any sort of entrep uh, entrepreneurism, was completely stifled while in India. I mean, I, I just didn't want to do anything risky, anything, anything. I mean, it's not like the US where you know, there would be somebody who would tell you that was great. This is exactly opposite. <clears throat> so then comes the question. So what is the magic of startups? And, and Naveen posed to me this question. Before I answer it, I thought I'll play a video. Uh, let me see if I can play this. Sì, buon uomo. Mi sa dire l'ora, per favore? E 5.35. Ma è sicuro? E 36, mo. Eh. Ah. Grazie. Eh? Prego. il ciuchino eh? eh no senta mi sa dire che ore sono adesso? andrò orta le sette e un quarto eh, ma sono le sette e un quarto spaccato incredibile ma lei come fa a leggere l'ora nelle palle del ciuchino scusi no io le alzo sotto c'è il campanile vedi? Sì, vedi? sette e un quarto <ride> So the point, the point is very simple. There's a, no magic here. It's about trying to look for the right direction and getting that clock and very much focusing on that. You know, so that question really was a, was a question for which there's not much of an answer here of saying there is any magic. And what I'm going to be talking today is about that observations, that clock towers that I've seen and looked at, and many of them are failures more than anything else that I've gone through. But fundamentally, if I, can, if, I, if I tell you there's magic, it's essentially what, what that, that the film says. It's a total BS or donkey balls in this particular case. So I want to I wanna walk myself back from the first job that I got into. Uh, uh, again, when I first graduated uh, from my master's program in Canada, I had two offers. One was a company called Newbridge Microsystems. I would have been employee number 20 at Newbridge Microsystems. And I was like 12,000 plus employee at Bell Northern Research. I went to my professor and he said, what is there to think, Rajiv? BNR, research facility. So, you know, the people who went to Newbridge, about a year and a half later, did an IPO. And that's when I first got this, hello, there's something wrong here, in terms of how it was. But having said that, BNR was a phenomenal experience for me. It was an experience where I hired a great manager. 
you know, I was the laziest guy in the team. I worked what was necessary, minimum required. I never put in a, a lot of hard work. And he called me about six months into it and I said, you know, you got the talent, but you don't have a visa to stay in this country. If you go at this rate, now I'll have to send you back. And it really set a passion in me. I mean, it, it was very, very important that he did that in my life. And I started working very hard from that day. I mean, it's, it's just fundamentally turned a switch on. And I, to date, appreciate what he, what he did. I mean, at that time, obviously, it was a different perspective. But fundamentally, when you look back at it, he asked me to sort of change myself and put, put in a lot of hard work. And, you know, again, it was a carrot and stick. He promoted me twice in the next six months. I got started seeing the benefits of what I was doing as well. So it was a great experience. So in 1991, I come for a conference here in January uh, for uh, a conference in, in actually chip design software, ICCAD. And you know, in Canada, I was wearing this big thick jackets at that time, I had brought it along and here everybody is sort of in, in t-shirt. That was a good year, it wasn't very cold. And I called my wife and I said, let's move to California. It was just the weather that brought me here. So I went back to BNR and my manager said, we got to write next year's objectives. And I said, there's no point, I'm, I'm leaving. So he assigned me for a year here. He said, you know, why don't you try this out before you move? So I'll give you a job. We're working with Cadence and you come in and work at Cadence. So that was my second sort of effort. And that's where I sort of got a taste of entrepreneurialism. <coughs> I was a development manager at, at Cadence for a new product. And I still remember I was working on a new product called Analog, and in the Analog uh, division, it was a new thing that Cadence was attempting to do. And I had a flight with a co-founder of uh, Cadence Design Systems, Jim Solomon, from, uh, I believe it was San Francisco to uh, have Melbourne, Florida. And you know, he had lots of drinks in, in, in a few nice wines. And this was my first ever first class trip. He brought me up and said, sit, sit down with me. So I asked him, you know, what did, have you done wrong or what would you do differently? And he told me a line, the product you're working on in analog, I would have done that as a startup. That sent a big light bulb on me. I, I came back and the next week I, I found the first startup. I took it up and I resigned and he asked me why. I said, you said, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a nice thing to do a startup. So that was how I sort of got into it. It was actually somebody in a drunken stage giving me the advice that it was a mistake that this new product that I was working on should have been done as a startup. So I took it up and I was totally inspired to do startups. And the first company that I worked on was a company called Logic Vision. And so one of the co-founders, it was formed in my bedroom, was, was where the computer was, because the two other founders were in Canada and we were doing a chip. Uh, this was in, in an area called test automation. And we were doing a chip with Apple. Apple was our first customer. And I still remember that there were none of us, we were very frugal. We had lack of business experience written all over us. One of the co-founders, his dad was, uh, ran a jewelry business in India. So he was the business guy. <laughs> the, <laughs> The second person, you know, he had some experience of doing marketing at Mitsubishi. He was the marketing guy, and I'm the R&D and support guy. So this is the three of us, and we had a bunch of consultants writing a few things. So we did this chip, and you know, it was actually uh, the, the uh, he's not here, but it's Kamalesh Ruparal. I know he's also a Thai member who was my first ever customer. That uh, till then, I've written a lot of code, but I've never sold any software in my life. So we had this negotiation. Next Monday, they are doing a tape out. This Thursday, we have this meeting with their purchasing guy, Kamalesh, the designer, and a director. So we had like four people from them. And we know the, you know, was the CEO at that time. He told us like, you know, for people reason, we don't want to be one guy versus four of them. Why don't you come along? And so everybody went, the consultant, and all four of us are there sitting down with Apple, and trying to negotiate a price. And you know, I've never seen that process of negotiation. To me, this is like all very, very new. And you know, our presentation, which you know, our CEO had done, had how much money we save for this particular chip for Apple. We save you two billion if you add design for test into your system. I'm looking, wow, this sounds good. So then the customer asked us, 
and a purchasing guy, so how much does it cost? He said only 10% of your savings. That's like $200 million. The guy just sits up and says, that's 10 years of my software budget for EDA. <laughs> and the meeting completely started deteriorating. It was like the designer is trying to take the thing out. He's like, how can we hit our schedule for Monday? How do we take this out? So it's pandemonium at this time. So I and the three of us went to the next room. I said, let me do the negotiation now. So, I mean, everybody's like, what have you done in negotiation? I said, well, we are, we are, we are out of here anyway. Let's go back in. So I went in and it was no different than negotiating in Indian markets, right? I went in and said, you know, how much money do you have? <laughs> was the first question I asked. <laughs> how much money do you have? And they were all like looking at it. We got $750,000. That's not enough. <laughs> you need 1.2 million. And so we struck a deal at 1 million. Apple gave a press release, which is very big because for all of you who have done business with Apple, know that getting a press release from Apple was, was virtually impossible. But because the tape out was that important, we got a press release, we got it out. But from the next day, I, I realized something. You know, sitting back and writing code, while it's interesting, if we don't define how we're going to make money and how we're going to be successful, this is all a waste of time. So from next day, and, and you know, the whole team used to say Rajiv was on a strike because he's trying to ask the question, how are we going to make money? So everything we write, I'm asking the question, how are we going to get make money? Because one of the problems we had, and even to the end, that company had the problem that it had a very unique IP, but monetizing that IP because the runtime of that tool was, so you can sell it as a tool, you can sell it as an IP, and they were in a conundrum between those two solutions. So every day was a, was a debate after that one and a half years that we had gotten to the first customer of how we would make money. And that really struck a big chord in me, knowing that you know, it's great to write all this code, it's great to define the problem, but a startup is always about making profit, trying to understand the addressable market you're in, the sales, and how do you actually make the sales process happen. So it's a very, very good learning curve that I went through at Logic Vision. And then I picked a tool. So while at, uh, Amber, uh, while at Logic Vision, I had some licenses from Synopsys, which, uh, which Apple had given us to see how to integrate our tools with, uh, with their platform. And I felt I could beat the Synopsys tools. And so, and, and by the way, the runtime of the tool was like two, three days. I thought we could make lots of money and we formed Ambit Design Systems, right? And there were a number of things that I have as, as personal takeaways from that, that, that particular company. First and foremost is my lack of inability or my inability to scale with the amount of growth of the, of the team, the investors. I mean, we were turned down by 31 venture firms for this company. On Sandal Road, pretty much everybody said no to Ambit. And you know, until we got the first few customers, first few things, we had 50 private investors, $750,000. So it's a company where we had decided, one ICCAT conference, one, one in, a, in, a, in a November, that we're gonna shut down this company. We had gone to the conference, all of us were sitting in a table, and our competition synopsis of CTO was on the podium. And somebody asked a question, what do you think about Ambit? And he basically said, these guys don't know anything about synthesis, it's a solved problem. And we had decided to close down. Next Monday morning, everybody for four months went without a dollar of salary. And we just wanted to prove that we can take him down. So it wasn't love that kept us together, it was a hatred for synopsis. <laughs> it was just plain, outright hatred for synopsis that, that kept us together. And you know, I mean, the company had, in the conference room, the, in the first room, they had a dartboard with, with synopsis right in the middle. It was just daily punch it down and get it, get it uh, to attack them. But one thing I, I clearly got out of that was I had not built a relationship in that whole process with the employees, the families of employees. I didn't even know, you know, when the company was 30 people, I probably could confuse still the names of people. It was that bad because as an entrepreneur, you didn't think about that interpersonal skills of building with respect to your own employees, let alone your investors, your customers, and explaining your point of view. And I clearly 
did not do a good job of that. I'm giving you advice of my failures more than my successes. Well, one thing which we did great, uh, it was the power of marketing. I mean, and Wink was the VP of marketing at that time. I'll tell you, we were, this culture of hatred for synopsis meant we could do things that probably didn't, <laughs> didn't look too right. We, we actually, in their launch party, we could take their customers away. And we were really straight in your face marketing style of operations. But the power of marketing and what we did to actually not only create a great technology, but then flaunt it and let everybody know that we really can thrash them was very, very fundamentally very, very big. So it was something that, that taught us the power of marketing. <coughs> and personally, for a personal growth perspective, I knew the need to build relationships between all my employees. And I took it to the next level in, in Magma. For example, in Magma, I knew up to about 400 employees, I knew every employee, I knew every one of their wives and probably their kid's name. I, I mean, even in the worst of times of Magma when we had litigation, I did not have attrition because, you know, the family is rooted for us. We did not just have the employees root for us. We had a culture of building that, that team spirit, that whole cohesiveness. And we were like giving it to them. All the negative news could be delivered in the right fashion, but we were absolutely awesome in, in, in creating the technology. I also had a great set of investors. So again, giving you one more anecdotal experience of my investor relationship. At Ambit, I had a very bad relationship with the venture guy. And at uh, you know, Magma, I, I had Mark Perry, who's a, a, a partner, who was a venture partner, general partner at uh, NEA, who was my, on my board. And Mark, was not initially when he invited me to do a presentation. I was so reticent of having VCs on my board because of my past relationship. I said, you know, you get no voting rights. You get, you know, I listed five things like an abrasive guy right in front of the whole partnership of NEA. And they signed up to it. And three months later, I walked to him and I said, I want to take away that piece of paper and scrub it and throw it away. Because he was adding so much value to the company. From a financial perspective, that company, Magma, went without having problems of option dating issues. It's thanks to Mark Perry. What did I know about finance at that point? I had very little knowledge. We had Andy Beckelsheim as an investor, somebody who you could sit down 10 minutes with and walk away with a million ideas. I had, you know, Andy uh, Atik, I had a phenomenal set of investors and a board at, 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 at Magma. You could be walking into a board meeting and you get a ton of ideas and you can openly collaborate and work with them. We had high differentiation. We made one fatal mistake and it actually cost us three years of our life. We had an employee who actually worked on something, some IP at Synopsys. He brought in that IP into our company. He patented it here. So he's like a stupid thief who steals a TV, then puts it out for sale. And by the way, the TV did not work, so we did never used it either. So it was one of those patents where the guy came in from Synopsys, patented it here, and the patent really does not work. But Synopsys got a real good arrow to sue us. And then, so in 2005, and they knew very well that it does not work. They sued us in 28 litigations were exchanged between us in six countries, costing us $72 million. I had 55 lawyers working for me. From 2005 to 2008 was a, but we learned a few things in that whole process. So this litigation, you know, I mean, I, I hope none of you have that experience in your life because it is probably one of the worst things that I went through. It was one of those experiences where they would serve to me every Friday evening at home. <coughs> and it, was, it was like a war room between us going on. And after the third litigation, I told my board, I want to do the same the other side. So our DGS got served every Friday. Uh, he, I get served on Friday, Monday morning, he'll be getting a reply serving at his house. So we got to a point of a ferocious fight that both of us had to finally call and, and the judge ordered us to spend time at the Fairmont in San Jose saying, you two guys need to sit down, cool it and sit down. And, you know, I mean, that ended up in the eventual sale of Magma to Synopsis. That was the actual one day, two days that we spent, that we came out. 
I still remember the day I spent with him. But, you know, I mean, we have very little common interest. I mean, he's a guitarist and, you know, so we started talking about, let's not talk about a lawsuit. So he started talking about guitars. And, you know, only thing I do outside of high tech companies is some gardening of my roses and things like that. So we had, you know, very little really in terms of what we could talk. But by the end of the day, we knew we had to solve the problem. And we solved the problem. And, you know, it was, it was a great experience that I hope nobody has to ever repeat again. But $72 million flushed down the company. We rebuilt ourselves and created more value. And it was a great company from the team, the morale, even through the darkest of times, I had very little you know, uh, people leaving the company issues. I mean, I had no retention issues. It was one of those unique opportunities where we did a phenomenal job at keeping that and keeping the lights on. And that's because very simple, the team was, was, had that complete competitive team spirit that we built as a company. So, you know, what have I taken away from all these things? Ultimately, it's a, some motherhood and apple pie statements here. Getting to profitability, very, very important, especially in enterprise licenses. Now, I'm not talking about B2C side of things where you can spend and spend and spend. I have most of my life has been on enterprise side of things. Getting to profitability as quickly as possible means getting to an independence level. Frugality, and it's a culture. It's a culture that you build within every one of your startups. It does not matter whether you've taken 10 million, 20 million, 30 million. Building that frugality into the culture of the company gives you a very good DNA for execution. The other items is, remember, one single guy and you need to build a culture where that person with that bonfire idea is given the ability to stand up, talk, and get it done. I mean, I have, at Magma, we have products that have been done by one guy with a spark idea and typically there's 20 guys trying to kill it. And your culture, you, what you build in your company to allow that, to allow that questioning of, the, of what you think is the basis with which you build the company, very, very important viewpoint. Again, you know, don't think a startup when you form, and I had this at uh, you know, Ambit, everybody said within six months we'll be bought. It took three years, I and mean, three years is not bad. It's not very long. But your horizon cannot be that there's going to be an acquisition. And, and, and every VC will tell you, oh, you're perfect for this guy to be bought. Fundamentally, that won't happen. Setting yourself and building a company towards a very short-term oriented view always turns to bite you in the back. You want to build a long enough viewpoint. And then there are a few observations that come in. At the end of it, there are plenty of big waves. At any given time, if you build a successful business, there's 20 others who look like you. It's easy to get a press release, and it's easy to claim that they're doing exactly what you're doing. So the pace at which you're paddling is absolutely very, very important in, in how you do that. The other aspect of things, I have in general, in all the startups I've done since Magma as well as before, surround you with people who are smarter than you. I would rather be the dumbest guy in that room asking some dumb questions, and there are very good, smart people who are answering the questions. It's very, very important to, to build. I've seen many, many cases where people who are entrepreneurs, because of the character of what we are built in, want to actually say, I am right. When fundamentally, if you can build yourself with that smarter people, and you can build a culture of getting that feedback, you get better value than what you would get otherwise. I've said this once, I'm gonna say this again, and I do this with all my startups, which is fostering an open culture. I did a very bad job at Magma, at Ambit on this. I, you know, every bad news I tried to not tell the employees. I could not deliver bad news. Fundamentally, you have to learn how to deliver bad news with a good light at the end of the tunnel and why they should stay to achieve that. That's a speech and a, 
and a presentation that you should be able to do at every instant in your life through a startup uh, side of things. If you try to hide it in a startup, everybody knows it whether you like it or not, especially if you're getting some amount of success. So do not, you know, I, I'm of the opinion, cap tables, all of that becomes almost like everybody knows every aspect of things. And if, if you're trying to hide things, it usually comes back to haunt you uh, in, the, in the longer term side of things. And this is, this is a problem with a lot of startups, incredible product focus. You think you've reached 90% or 80%? Oh, I got this other cool idea. And I think a lot of startups who I work with know that, like, you know, let's try to finish what we have before we take on a lot newer features. So this is an aspect of things. And again, we need to finish that, bring to a level where a lot of customers can start using that. Almost everything I'm saying in these statements are motherhood and Apple Fire, but I've got to tell you, 90% of the startups I'm seeing do not have a culture that uh, focuses so much on making that one product that you're working on to be extremely successful. You get to the 90 percentile and you assume it's a foregone conclusion that the last 10 percent gets done. Solving that, getting it done, is a very key part of what you do. And the last one is this, right? If anyone thinks startup is not hard work, you're wrong. For 16 years, I probably have spent very little time with my kids. And that's a guilt I had when I sold Magma. I was not ready to go back and jump into something. I wanted to spend two years with them. So they had reached an age where, you know, dad had gone from cool to fool. So, you know, they did not want that association. I give it to them, but, I, you know, clearly they, they did not want that. But it's a fundamental trade-off that you need to figure out how to do that, right? And I think, you know, having that supportive system in my particular case with my wife was absolutely essential to being able to do that. And I'm going to tell you all, I mean, you know, it's, it's important to have that idea that you're making off trade-offs in your personal life. It's a reality of doing any startup. You're going to perspire, do hard work, there will be lots of projects, and you got very little money. The easiest solution that a lot of engineers will come and say, why are we not hiring two, three people? I have, I have this question in some of the startups that I'm currently involved with. Let's add two, three people. Well, it's all the same budget. And it's, it's very, very important to realize this. And ultimately, the focus has to be on revenue growth and making the company profitable very quickly. And that's, that's, that's one of the things that I, I clearly go over with. But having gone through all those negatives, you know, it's about the most exciting experience that you can go through, being an entrepreneur. Go for it. It's, it's just, as you pump through this adrenaline, I mean, I, I want to give you something. When I was doing my undergraduate and graduate school, I probably slept for 18 hours a day and went to school and class and everything for six hours. I reached a point where on three hours, I could operate. And I just, it was the adrenaline. It was the love of the project that kept me up. It wasn't any other aspects of things. It's like I really loved what I'm doing. And that's the beauty of Silicon Valley, right? You're all in a place where you get the next person who's smarter than you. You get to see a lot of new cool technologies. You get to do a lot of startups, which are very, very cool. If you actually can love that product and can actually take the, the, that to your heart, you will be able to do that 18, 19 hours of hard work and turn the uh, order of, of priority quite a bit. So, you know, I've been very lucky and I just wanted to kind of, you know, I'm, I'm not prepared too much on, on what I'm doing currently. I will give one slide, but before I get there, I just wanted to end with this, right? It's pretty simple. It's all a lot of motherhood and apple pie, but a lot of people do not follow that and actually deviate quite considerably from that, from those statements I've, I've made. Again, you do some stuff, most fails. It happens in a startup too. It's your job as a founder to make sure that you can identify what is successful, be able to take that over, 
and make it into something, something that's quickly successful and you turn it around as quickly as possible. All right. So Naveen, I mean, I'll go ahead and let people ask questions. Thank you, thank you, Ajit. Thank you again for lots of wisdom and insights. I'm sure while you guys are getting ready, uh, let me ask one question. Um, so there is a, um, if you do, uh, oh, I don't know. <coughs> can you hear me now? We could hear you before. We could hear you before. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so th just do a search on Rajiv uh, Madhavan. So there is a very nice interview by a lady called Peggy um, in uh, something called EDA Cafe Blogs. So I just picked up one question, but there were a lot of great answers, <laughs> which Rajiv, I really enjoyed reading that. So usually, you know, I just do a quick search to find if I can find some dirty stuff and then I can start my Q&A with that question, but I couldn't. So anyway, the, my question is, uh, one of the things uh, Rajiv, you mentioned in that was a lot of angel investors should be looking for um, you know, breakthrough technologies which can be developed under two million or so where you can sell the company for 10 to 30 million. And I think you also had that experience also in a couple of companies, looks like, right? Those incidental... No, that, I mean, that, that was very specific in the EDA technology. I mean, okay. I, I think, you know, in that particular segment, the number of exits which are more than 100 million is not very many. There's a lot of 20, 30 million singles that you can hit. And it was actually very easy to hit singles. I've had three or four investments I've done in that space where I've actually been very lucky to get, you know, you put in half a million in a round, which is about a million dollars, and nine months from there, you get bought for 30, 40 million dollars. I've had, you know, zero software. There's a whole pile of them that, that could be done in that phase. Today, the ability to do that has also gone down. The chip design and, and, and chip design software in general is a much more tougher field uh, in terms of actual revenue and in terms of the cost of doing the business. It's all inverted upside down in that it takes a lot of money to make one today. And if the number of customers, number of semiconductor companies have gone down, the number of people EDA companies can sell to has gone down. So the purchasing power is, is absolutely zero in that space, which is part of the reason why, you know, in 2005, I wanted to sell and get out of EDA but we got sued at Magma as a company. I mean, I had actually tendered my resignation to my board in 2005, and the week after we got sued, and the board comes to me and says, Rajiv, you gotta stay. So I did three years to sort of make sure that I go past the litigation, and then that's 2008, the quarter from hell, where you don't know what's happening to the world economy. We are like, we're missing every deal. Everybody's calling and saying, Rajiv, that deal we promised, we can't do. So again, I had to give two years of jail sentence to a decision that I'd already done, which is I wanted to leave and build something else. But you know, it's an integrity. With the team you have built, you have hired these people. You know their family, and I'm as much obligated to them as they are obligated to me. And that was a very important aspect of why I stayed from 2005. Every morning I looked up in the mirror, I don't want to go to work with 55 lawyers and accountants hounding me. I'll be in meetings, which I just did not want to be in. But every morning, you know, you complain it, you put it up and you go. So, you know, that was a period at which that interview was done, where we were climbing out of a trough that we were in. But it's a, it's a very different period that I went through in my life. It is just something that, that was absolutely a very tough experience uh, to go through that, that painful period of my time. So just a quick follow up to that. So now since you've kind of, um, you know, not doing anything in EDA, but you've been involved with a number of other exciting companies from what you mentioned earlier to me. So do you see any opportunity like the same kind of investment? In, no, it's uh, very different investments. I'm going to pull up one slide to okay. just kind of give you an idea from that perspective of what I have been focused on. So since leaving Magma, I've done, none of these are, are chip design companies. These are a collection of about 15 companies and, and investments that I have done, of which five to six, I'm very, very active. I'm on the board of, uh, I've done major investor. I wrote the first check in, in everything in the first line that you see there. Uh, I am the first check writer. Some of them, the companies are here. You can talk to the founders like Krishna, 
Shankar, you know, I mean, I think there's somebody else was supposed to come in, but uh, it's it's a model which I'm calling parallel entrepreneurism because I don't have a good word for it. Krishna sometimes calls me as a founding investor. Amar, who's at Reflection, calls me founder. Uh, I've seen, uh, uh, you know, Shankar say active investor. <laughs> I don't know it, a terminology, but I get involved in understanding the technology at a depth and pace and trying to help them in the sales and operations side wherever I can. Right? So it's a very different model, uh, a model in which I can spend the energy to actually learn a lot and at the same time, hopefully add value in terms of contribution value of what, what we can do in each of these space. Right? None of them are in EDA. Everything is in either big data, uh, cloud infrastructure, and user identity management and IoT on the on the back end side of IoT, which is on the very uh, you know not on the device itself, but everything on the back end software side of things. So that's what the focus has been. Okay, great, thank you. So let me open the questions to the audience. So starting with Alan. Okay, hold on a second. Can, uh, Alan is waiting over there, Tahir, next to you. Yeah. I'm waiting for the microphone. Uh, first, I'd like... It's on. First, I'd like to thank you for a very informative and entertaining talk. You've been for an old timer like me. I've been in Santa Clara for 45 years. Next. Most people don't realize it, but BNR was the Bell Labs of Canada throughout the 70s and 80s and 90s. And in that regard, could you tell us a little bit more about what you did at BNR, and in particular, what was it that enabled you to get the expertise to be successful as an entrepreneur? So I joined BNR in the design team. I have an a double E background, no computer science background. I had written some software because in summer I did one or two jobs to make some money uh, while at uh, Queen's University doing my master's program. But everything I've done was all in hardware design. And we was, I was hired by this group which was doing gallium arsenide design. Back in 89, the idea was silicon is going to die and gallium arsenide was going to take over. So I was in the research facility for gallium arsenide and we had essentially to do a chip which required certain requirements from the software, which our software team internally and Cadence at that time, as we called ECAD, said it cannot be done by traditional tools. So I told, this was after six months, I told my boss who had, who had threatened to fire me that I think I can do it. I read a bunch of papers, I had no idea. I mean, I was a fool with absolutely no knowledge but a lot of energy into it. I picked it and I wrote a router tool for placing, for routing gallium arsenide designs. Six months later, BNR killed the gallium arsenide program, but we were doing 40 to 80 chips a year during that period because it was a phenomenal, as you pointed out, it was a research lab. We were doing 80 chips of which probably 10 would go into production. I mean, it was like really have fun, do a lot of chips. Out of the 80 chips, about 60 to 70 was using my software. On, on it was uh, actually routing the, the chip and, and doing the actual GDS2, the output for sending to the mass shop. And I had no clue what I had created, but I was getting support and calls from different organizations in the company because they were using my stuff for doing things that I had not intended it to. And three months of the support job, so they moved me into this organization called, you know, at that time, I, I forgot what it was, some infrastructure and support organization. And I was given the job of, with two, three other people to do this new routing tool. About three months into it, I realized the support is not something I wanted to do at that time, especially. So I jumped into doing something called Logic Synthesis. Again, BNR was a phenomenal opportunity for me. It was the Bell Labs of Canada. And it allowed me to do any research in anything in EDA that I could play with. I could come up with my FPG architecture. I, I did really three years of phenomenal fun experience. Uh, everything I learned in BLSI design, especially from the software side, is that three years of my life. Everything in software I learned 
was picking up books at that time and learning it. I you know bought a Kerning and Ritchie book, learned C and started coding at that time. That was like the learning of what it. I was a, it was a great experience. And I was not fearful of trying anything like, you know, when I uh, moved to Cadence Analog because I didn't know anything about the space. I was totally a, 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 a fool who felt I could do everything in that space. And I think, you know, I was fearless in, in, because I had no training in that space. So nobody told me this cannot be done. And it was, it was a phenomenal opportunity that came from that experience. So I loved that three years of, of experience at BNR. Uh, and it was, it was a great, great place to have learned a lot of new things. Tahir. Rajiv, you mentioned uh, that uh, two things uh, work well when you have a startup. One is have an open culture. The other thing you mentioned is make sure that you focus on the end product, make the team focus on something that they are doing and not let them leave it halfway done. Sometimes both these uh, uh, requirements have a conflict. And you, you mentioned in your company, you, you, you had the culture where you allowed people to come up with ideas and let them run with it. So how did you manage to keep the team focused on the products that were already ongoing or you knew had to be done one form or shape, as well as allow other people, uh, 20 other people to stand up and say, I have a new idea, which could become a distraction for, for others. So we, we had a process of how we define the new products that we are doing. In fact, some of the new products that were not getting executed, I had the team, I actually built a, you know, outside my house, the, and there's now an office space that, that I house a lot of startups, and, and I know Krishna is looking at it, he spent a lot of time there. Uh, but every, every, I had new projects which was not going well, moved there physically. Saturday, Sunday, they had to work there. And I'm spending all the time. It, had, it either gets killed there or it actually comes out successful through that. That's the last ditch effort. We had three or four products. We had a Spice product, which was incredibly successful, which came out of that, uh, you know, we call it war room and it extended on Saturday, Sunday. I, I kept it there mainly because I wanted it to be isolated from all the things that were happening at, at work, right? Because at work, forming a separate team and giving it, it's sometimes very, very difficult to do. So we had a third floor, half the area was coordinated for some of these new projects and the others were in this other project. It didn't mean that the people in this project will never get transferred into that, but we sort of had that culture of dividing up the team to try these new things while we had the old products underway, but we had to cut the products and have the team to be able to do that. And you have to be able to hold people responsible. At the end of it, if you give them an excuse saying, I'm also doing this, but I can't do this, then you are going to be a failure, right? So you need to figure out how to do that. All right? Yes. Uh, Mike. Really amazing story. Uh, it's it's always inspirational. Um, I guess key the key was the passion for learning, learning a lot of different things, and um, the ability to go horizontal in a lot of different areas, and then be able to go vertical in whatever you decide to go. Uh, looks like you do a lot of parallel entrepreneur <laughs> entrepreneurism, and um, how do you manage? So every. So it's, it's very interesting, right? At any given time, out of those things, I cannot have more than a company which requires a lot of my time, right? I mean, that's the reality of it. I mean, I'm picking on Shankar here, sitting here. Shankar, join, I joined the board. Today, I don't spend as much time as I did in the first six months to a year. It's, it's actually kudos to Shankar for having built a team. That he's, he's the CEO of VPS. I don't have to spend as much time. I did not know anything about software defined power until he came and pitched to me. And, you know, I, I was probably took about three to six months to learn. And I spent a lot of time in the early days. Um, but I hardly spent, uh, you know, I spent time with you. I was there, but not too much compared to what I did. I'm just giving you a percentage of time, right? Whereas Krishna's company, I spent probably 24 seven now. Uh, because I've, I feel the opportunity is there. I think it's a tremendous 
a, 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 you know, execution uh, a challenge that we have, but it's a challenge that we, once we deliver, it is, it is set for success. We just need to go out there and do it. And so I spend a lot of time doing that with him and the team. So, uh, and, and I did that a year ago at Reflection. So I sort of have to reach a point where four out of the six in the top, and, and you know, some of these things like Go Euro and Veradox, uh, you know, the, the company never really required too much of my effort. Kudos to the founders. But you know, once you get down this path, you have to expect that any company requires a lot of time on uh, any aspect of things. And again, I'm not interested in any titles or anything like that. I'm interested in helping genuinely the entrepreneur get to selling the, the product, getting to define the product, and getting it out there. I, I, that's simply the focus with which I'm operating in each of these companies. So I, I know I'm truly enjoying my life. I cannot uh, say that, and I don't have the quarterly pressure of delivering a number every quarter. <laughs> you know, he has the pressure, I don't. This is a phenomenal opportunity from that perspective. Hey, fantastic speech. Thank you for sharing your experiences and especially the learnings. How do you, uh, what do you look into startup uh, when they come and pitch you? And how do you select? What are the qualities you look into? So the team, uh, even if it's a, I mean, I'm not expecting the company to have a very strong management, a very strong engineering. All aspects of it will never be solved at the stage I am talking to these companies. But the willingness of the founder to accept that open culture is very, very important to me. Right? Somebody who learns, somebody who accepts the problems and can and is willing to then kind of learn, right? Because I am expecting a full open relationship of being able to say that, and they can say that, and, and I'm very interested in building that relationship. That's very important to me. And that's the first thing I look for. That I mean, if that's not a pass, I certainly spend a lot of time with the team before I fund of taking them to prospective customers. That's where I work, whatever networks I can get to. I mean, people know me, know that if I had to get to a particular customer, I get there hook or crook. And I will get there to their CIOs or whoever it takes. I'll search and get there. I'll take that company to two or three customers and I sit in those meetings. And I can, even if I don't invest, I give them the reason why I cannot invest or why I feel it's not a company. But ultimately, the, the products are well-defined in conjunction with your customer. And you may think you know well, and I thought that in many of these places, but the first two engagements sets you right and defines your product a lot more than what you could have otherwise done. So attending them, even when you have an idea, and you need to have those customers with whom you can have that open a dialogue. What if I do this, right? I mean, and that's a very important asset that I hope to train every entrepreneur has to have that, but I'm, I participate in helping that happen. So if I've done one and two of those diligence, then I typically get engaged into the system. All right. Next question. Yes. Whoops. I have a few specific questions. Um, you talked about power of marketing. Um, for a company that was going to shut down in about two or three days, uh, where did you come up with the budget for that, budget for marketing? Oh, so once we had the benchmarks and we actually, our first customer in the case of Ambit was a company called Chromatic Research, which was half the office space was shared with Synopsys. So we would be walking into Synopsys lobby, half the lobby is Chromatic Research, and we would clash them in a benchmark in their building, essentially. And once that benchmark was over, we had a glut of investment opportunities. I, it was not, funding was not the issue for that company after that. But we literally had to deliver the product before which we had, and real benchmark results, real, we had uh, SGI, a customer. And once you got past that, that's a different problem. Right? Sometimes some companies, you're destined to fight the fight all the way to creating a product before which somebody will see the value for, especially venture guys will see the value. Again, that's something that I've learned from my Ambit experience and even subsequently. In the venture community, there are probably about five to 10 people who can see a great product even before everybody else. 
the vast majority of them are just following what everybody else is doing. Right? And for a lot of technologies, you may not be able to get to that, that person. And even if you did, in my particular case, we were not good in communicating. So we did not get funding, partly because we were bad in communication in the early stages. But the key was once you deliver, results speaks for themselves. If you can get to revenue and if you can show real customer numbers, nobody can sit there and say, oh, there is no market for this. All right. So if you are an entrepreneur and you're trying to find it tough to, uh, to, to get money, I have only very, one very simple advice. Don't give up. Be frugal, get to the least uh, defined product that you can successfully sell for that product and thrash any competition, anything, and deliver on real numbers. There will be investors coming to you whether it happened in the early stages or not. So that's the basic story behind that. How much, uh, the, the next question, I. Hijacking the conversation here. Um, how much of your success, or uh, as an entrepreneur, do you attribute to your expertise and uh, technical expertise? So every product, even in this list, I do reach a point of being able to explain. I mean, I reach to a point of of needing to understand it at a, at, at least a basic level of discussion that most investors won't. I need to understand that whether it's these companies or because I can't see myself taking you to a customer without me being able to actually understand and articulate the value of this, this as I see it, right? So yes, understanding some elements of technical is important, but more than that, listening to the customer. And that does not need me to get down to how to implement any of these features. I can trust you for doing that. But once you can do that, being able to actually capture that value proposition and, and seeing the reaction of a customer to that is very, very important in the very early stages of the company. Right. So it's not my technical expertise. I, I don't think that. I think it's the ability to wanting to listen to the customer. Let me... Uh, yes, Bing. Yes, Bing. Um, okay. So, uh, Rajiv, one thing that didn't come out, uh, you know, most companies, most successful companies, when they have a successful kind of a product, they have a very, very hard time coming up with yet another second breakthrough kind of a product. Uh, there are very, very few companies that can do that. And especially in EDA industry, there was none. All the other things came through acquisition. And yet in Magma, uh, with the cloud issue of lawsuits kind of hanging over the core product, uh, you were able to come up with a, a, a completely different product in a completely different space, which quickly became a market leader. Can you comment on that? I mean, yeah. So actually, it's very interesting. At Magma, everybody told me at a particular period that Rajiv, you're risking it by attacking new products. But we had cloud on our existing product. Cloud in terms of the litigation uh, threat of what will a judge, and I explain to a judge that this guy stole it but we don't use it, is not going to be a fun ex experience. So we were always worried we are gonna lose the lawsuit and lose that particular product. So we had to start a new product which replaces that product, not because of the technology merit of the new product, but this product was, was if we fail in the litigation, I could lose the entire company. So it got to a point where we, we asked ourselves, we had cash coming in, we can't buy any company because our market cap had gotten trashed because of the lawsuit. The only thing we could do was, well, there was a great kid, Anirudh Devgan, who came up and told me, I can do the spice engine. I went mano mano two days with him and had a whole smart set of guys and we authorized it. We put them into a separate Austin team had people in Austin and we crushed it in, in about six months. And, and, and in, in the meeting, I told him, look, I can give you a, a spice tool so you don't have to read these readers and parsers, et cetera. We bought a couple of assets for cash, but they were not the greatest technology that we bought because we had to buy assets, then replace everything and create a new product. And we created that. And at the end of the lawsuit, our revenue from those actually outpaced our, our core products. That took us to an IPO. 
But the culture was we're going to leave it alone and we're going to make it happen. I remember my sales guys who knew how to sell one particular product come to me and say, Rajiv, this product really does not fit with that. Maybe we can tie it together and sell. And it was actually completely left field. One is an analog design tool, one is a digital design tool. I had to fire a couple of salespeople or hire, and hire a couple of salespeople who were focused on me on this quarter. So we really had a culture which was about we are in, in under threat, we need to execute. And the beauty is the entire team was actually knew that strategy within the company, within the technical team, even the sales knew that this is imperative for the company. But having a guy like that, in that particular case, the leader of that, Anurudh is now running all of Cadence's IC design uh, team. I introduced him to you. Yes, you get, I introduced me to him. <laughs> you wanted to do a startup, and I, encourage, I basically told him, no, I'll make you more wealthy by doing this in the company, and he did extremely well. Because in, in, you know, in, in three months after him joining, we knew what he's going to be leading, and it became a division from nothing. We did, a, a, as the market cap started improving, we bought four or five companies in that space. Uh, but for the Synopsys acquisition, we were on path to, to take down Cadence quite a lot in that particular space. We had a unique opportunity to do that. So, so, so the question really is that, was it a crisis that uh, got you to develop a second product? And is it because of the lack of crisis that most companies fail to innovate second time? Well, crisis had something to play with it, right? Essentially, the way I was looking at it, I mean, to me, these new products was my only lifeline to any sanity. I spent 80% of my time at work with these lawyers and accountants, and God, that, you know, that was that whole litigation experience of spending time in every meeting. It's about the D-Day, the Dooms uh, meetings. This was my diversion, and it was, was phenomenal to have that for the company. I mean, for me, that was how I took it. For the team, it was like a crisis mentality as well as we had the culture of rewriting our products. We could take a product and have a whole, take a team, put it outside, create a war room within the company, and we had shown this ability to do this over and over again at Magma. I mean, if, if I'm very proud of something at Magma, the ability on our product ex execution was just phenomenal. It was a culture that everybody felt doing this new product does not mean I'm working on an old product because he or she will get an opportunity to do the other product because of the openness with which we had a culture. So nobody was trying to just kill it, squash it, and we had a great, great execution vehicle on that side of things. So we created a lot of new things, and it was, it was a great experience from that perspective. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, some of these companies you mentioned, are they all local here and what stage the companies are? Is there any follow-on investment or only you are the sole investor? Oh, so most of them on the upper threshold has done some sort of follow-on investments for my first round and I have participated in, my, in the follow-on funds too. Uh, no, is there any other VCs participating? In yes, so for example, Reflection, uh, the last round was led by Intel Capital. Nike is an investor in that. Uh, VPS, we have some other investors who have come in, which is Data Collective. Uh, DC, which is an investor, Veridox has battery, Amplify in the subsequent round. So I think on the top side, for example, GoEuro had uh, a big round from NEA. Uh, they raised 10, 15 rounds. The middle ground are, are things which are earlier. Again, almost all of them have had, except for Lumoid and Crisply, everything in the first two rows has had subsequent round, uh, rounds done. And I'm I know I'm 6x higher in my investment from my first investment side of things, my average batting for these companies today. Just one more thing. It's not very clear whether you're investing on your own or do you have a team or you have venture capital arm or what? So typically I invest on my own, but then you know I look at the talent pool needed and bring in people uh, that are missing that would help complement us. Right? So if I need to hire a, a particular employee, and there's somebody who can help me in that, I would bring in someone who's got the talent for that and let that person invest into, into it. It's not, again, it's not about how much I invest, it's about helping the company complete that, that whole product and the process of, of doing that. Okay. So yes, I've also done my follow-on in all of them in the subsequent rounds. I participated because it's a, 
it's a trust of what I've shown and I've done that in every one of the companies that I've on that list there. Uh, the reason I ask you, Rajiv, is because uh, we were struggling with the definition of whether you're parallel or serial or whatever. Actually, there is a word for it, it's incubators or accelerators. That's what No, I don't believe it's incubators because I'm not providing office space, et cetera. That's the reason. Incubators, have to be office space. incubators be that I've seen so far do not get down to the product. I take Y Combinator as an example. You know, They don't get down to understanding the product or the definition of what I am doing. So I really, and I despise that word in, incubator because... I think, you know, charging people for office and this and that, that's not what, what I believe in. If I'm not adding contribution value, I'm just an angel investor and I move on. So I do not believe I'm doing incubation. Uh, you know, I'm trying to be a, a, a partner in helping them succeed. Um, Rajiv, let me ask you a question before someone else is ready. Um, as you alluded in your, um, I think, first startup, you had some heartache with some VCs. Yeah. So can you elaborate whatever you can? So the lesson for some of the entrepreneurs in the audience who haven't had experience with the VCs, what to, you know, what to look for or what to watch out? I know you did kind of mention... So, 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 so my weakness is the things I could have probably corrected in, in that whole process was try to build a relationship with all the investors, which I did not do well. Right? I mean, if I had been able to communicate... I mean, Conwall was an investor in the company. And Conwall tells me today, how come you didn't tell me all the issues? Well, so I did not. And I did not have the ability of explaining all the issues I was having with this VC firm to everybody else. And I think that's my fault. The VC on his own, he wanted to, I mean, we had done a Series A, four million round. We were about to take a, another round. We had an offer from LSI Logic at 40 million valuation. And we had one, he wanted to put money at 12 million. And he said he will block me because I had given all the rights away. I had no idea what rights meant, but as a participating, he could block me on the round. I found in the contract and something which said, corporate investors, I have an out. So I did sign the term sheet before I got into the fight and I had to leave the company. But I could not convince this and explain this to the team because I had not built a relationship with the team in the right fashion, and it was my fault in, in not having done that. Right? If it had happened at Magma, it would have been very easy to throw him out. I would have told you everybody would have stood up and just done that in, in a very short succession. But this was not how I, I had treated my employees, worked with them. I had not built a relationship with my colleagues. I mean, there was something drastically that he was trying to achieve, which is overarching. So basically, your lesson is watch out for the various these clauses, read them. Well, I mean, uh, from that, I mean, till then, you know, any lawyer puts me something, I just sign these documents as an entrepreneur. Now I have at least the ability to read and understand what it was, but it was through scars in my back. I, I mean, I don't give these rights knowingly. You know, even with doing that, you still do make some mistakes on these documents because you're not consciously doing that all the time. But these are important aspects of life. Thank you. Next question. Anyone? Here, here is one question. Uh, so looking five, ten years in future, you, up, you have... It's fine now? Yeah. Okay. So looking five, ten years into the future, now you have like a lot of companies under your portfolio the smaller companies and probably you're trying to grow them to the bigger level. What do you, what do you think, what is your vision for the next 10 years? You want to in, start up like more of such companies or you want to grow some of these kind, sort of companies to the bigger you ones? Know, if there are 30, 40 of these and they're all successful. All right. I, I'm, I'm mighty happy. Very Mission well. accomplished. Awesome. And at the same time, uh, I would have you know, learned 30, 40 different things. So what's the vision for the next 10 years? Well, I think, you know, in, we are in a very interesting time. I'm, I'm, I did not put some of those slides of how I view the next 10 years. I initially put it and then I thought it's about my story going backwards. Mm -hmm. My new chapter is just being written <laughs> for what I need to deliver, right? So, but I view this as a time where while there's some excesses in the valley in terms of valuations and a lot of mistakes being done, mm -hmm. fundamentally we have the grassroots of great technology happening. You know, everything that can be measured is going to be measured. 
whether it is from in IoT devices, data, cloud, mobile, you are going to have an infrastructure which is actually very, very unique, which gets the ability to measure data that you thought you could not measure. That brings in a huge problems of how do you analyze at scale these problems? How do you derive patterns that actually give you more prediction and more analytics capability from that? That gives you the question of how do you then turn around and make sure that the security aspects of it is addressed from, from this new world of what we are operating on. And all of this is happening at a time when the cloud and the Amazons of the world have brought the cost of doing these things down by a lot because you don't have to buy a lot of computers like old, the old, old days where you would have these servers in your, in your rooms, et cetera. You can actually rent these things. So costs have gone down. The opportunity to do a lot of things in data, mobile, cloud, and 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 you know, I see IoT as an extension to that is phenomenal. If I've 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 seen people say that software eats hardware, that's transition has happened in the valley. It's no longer a Silicon Valley; it's a software valley now. And I think that's going towards machine learning is going to eat half of the software that we see today. I'm a full believer in that. I absolutely think that 90% of the software that we write are rules and rules and rules and paradigms of rules being hard-coded. That's going to go away too. So we are at the cusp of some very unique innovation happening in the whole space that we are all operating in. There's room for multiple startups. Times cannot be any better than this today. We are sitting at a very good time. Next 10 years, yeah, there will be you know, some, some banks going bust, causing us headache in Silicon Valley. And I mean, all that will happen, but we are sitting at a great time in terms of the ability to create some unique new technology. Awesome, thank you. Yes. So, it's good to see you again. I haven't seen you in I was lucky enough to be your Series A investor in Magma. Uh, but, so when you look at your, I, I love the retrospective, when you look at your career, you see there was always a great challenge for you and you had something to prove. With the Ambit, kind of was uncomfortable exit. We knew you were gonna be successful with Magma. Magma had some problems with it. We knew you could, now you got a phase of your life where there's no real challenge. Actually there is, kind of. It's very interesting. Right now I'm attempting a lot of different things in new space. There's a bunch of VCs who, who sees is that he's a chip designer and yeah, he's done a couple of chips at BNR and he's done EDA. I have a lot to prove here, that's it. and I will prove it here. That's it. So that's the, that's, that's a very important thing for me. So 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 the for, so you have a formal transition from an operating executive to being a professional yeah. investor. And I really yeah. clearly want to make that that a stance I, I take, and I'm 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 happy that that many of them ask that question, and that's why my that portion of my chapter is yet to be written, but I am on a I'm declaring that mission very upfront. And I'm going to do it. Fantastic, yeah. So is your model, you, I, I don't want to get too into it, but are you taking common as well as preferred in the way you're it operating with these It all depends on, on what I'm doing. So yes, in the early stages, I'm, I'm doing that. And oh. if, I'm, if I'm coming in and doing a lot more work, you have to decide on that, yeah. what you want. And that, that's what, again, that relationship with the founder is very important to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And I don't want anybody in the team not understanding how I'm operating in this company either, right? I'm not, I want to be very transparent. Right. Um, you want to bring founder level value, but you don't want to, you don't want to have the operating role. You don't want to have a title. Uh, well, I take short term titles. For example, in reflection, I was a CEO for about eight months and I think I changed the company 100% in its direction. It was, it had machine learning, but it did not, it was focused on some wrong markets. And we set the product idea after talking to a lot of customers. Uh, and I, you know, I mean, 100% of the, of the products, the idea is I think Venk is an investor in that company. Venk knows the first pitch to the second pitch or third pitch was completely different. And by the third pitch, because I knew with the first pitch I had, I spoke with 10 customers after helping them. And I realized there is no money to be made. And ultimately, it's all about making money. Absolutely. And so we pivoted. It's the same algorithm, same technology, and it was a it was a great move. Yeah, yeah and that's what founders do, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, I have a 
Master, you really find this someone. I've only seen someone like Pradeep uh, who has value on the product market fit kind of stuff. There are a lot of people who can write chat. So there are very few people who can challenge you in your area of expertise and force you to uh, change. So here, here I, I said this thing about him, that if he's an investor, kicking and screaming, he'll drag you to success. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Rajiv, could you talk about uh, customers? How do you focus on which customers to go after? Uh, a lot of these companies are based on your past experience. So for these companies yeah. you're talking about? So for these companies, uh, you know, I mean, the customers are very diverse. So some could be, for example, in Reflection. I had, I have never worked in Nike, but I have because, I mean, and again, I'm not even the cool guy who wears the Nike shoes <laughs> and runs and, you know, I'm not even that guy. So. I found one of the investors, Patman Raman Guti, was he had a bunch of startups which Nike had worked with. And I went and told Patman, I need 25K from you first. And I took 25K and then I got him to say, give me an intro to Nike. <laughs> and I went to Nike. Right? So in many cases, the investors I bring along are people who can get me to that road. So there's somebody who's looking at your LinkedIn and if you have some friends in any of these companies, I'm looking at it because I need that help. And it's a question of which company, how, how do we get in, and that's what you need to figure out and, and get out there. So I'm not saying I knew a lot, but a lot of them just listen to the story and do want to meet, and I use that, but I just want to get there and meet with the people. I mean, uh, you know, if we have to get to the introductions through whatever contacts you can get to. And the beauty about Silicon Valley is somebody here knows someone at any one target customer we want to get to. Our job is to find that person and either get him involved in some fashion with the company or get his help without getting involved to get an intro to that company. Right? You work with a lot of startups and you talked about, you know, uh, most of them succeed, but some of the projects you kill. So what makes a company succeed or fail in early stages? So for example, at Reflection, I gave the team a choice. There was seven of them and we said, you know, look, they had some very unique machine learning technology, wanted to do it in publishing. And I went to Time Warner, I went to CNN, I, went, I met with a lot of management at different companies, publishing industry companies. And I found all of them loves our technology but was not willing to pay a dollar. I mean, essentially they want to get it for free. And I couldn't find a way in the short term to add monetize based on ads either. Whereas I found this whole customers of Nike and others who were willing to pay. So I, I told there were seven founders in the team that either we make this change or we are going to be dead, but it's going to be a slow death. And four of them immediately said, we're going to make the change. Three left in that particular case. But they had that discussion inside. I just threw the ball into the air and had to have them have that discussion, right? Because we were on a path which would not have been very successful for anyone. And three of them were wedded to, to where we apply this technology. And uh, this is a great advice to a lot of entrepreneurs. Do not be, it's all about making money. It's not what you use your algorithms for this or that. It's, it's how do you make the best best opportunity, uh, best revenue, best outcome with the technology and the knowledge you have. So the likely reason some of the startup fail because they can't connect with something that can be monetized. They don't, or, or they don't ask the question from a product marketing perspective. Is this the right direction or can I use that technology to create A, B, C options? Which of it is the best that I can make money quickly mm -hmm. and I can scale and build a company on? Uh, that's a question that needs to be asked. I, I mean, at Logic Vision, we did not ask that. I mean, I have to tell you, we just jumped in and wrote some code. We had no idea, uh, and we never asked that question until we sat in front of the first customer. We had actually done the work. So that's too late. It's much better to ask that question today at a very early stage than get to that end where you've burned three, four million dollars and, and you're asking that question. So in the logic vision, when you were all young and inexperienced, how did you get to Apple? 
Oh, no, I mean, that, you know, because we write papers and publications and things like that, and we, we had some contacts, right? I mean, getting to customers is, people think it's a challenge. If you know the right people and the right investors and you're willing to actually just go spend the time, that is not your challenge. You're, it's the ability of the founders to then listen to the customer mm -hmm. and not be as much better about, you know, if you're spending 45 minutes with a customer, if you're 45 minutes, 42 minutes, you have spelled your company and you've only got three minutes of question, you've done wrong. You should be able to explain in 10 minutes, listen 35 minutes. And then it should go down to 30 minutes by the time you get to a product where you're actually saying, this is what I do. But a lot of entrepreneurs like to take that 45 minutes and spend 42 minutes talking about how they're going to change the world. So that's all I'm saying. It's just how you draft yourself to be able to change that, to listen. You're in 10 minutes, sell your idea, 35 minutes, listen back. Okay, we're gonna have two more questions for the lucky two. I didn't, I didn't get the last portion of the question. I, I didn't hear, maybe microphone. More of the traditional businesses like retail or like, rather than more of the technology focus, I know technology has like high returns, but being part of the portfolio of having- No, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's something that challenges and something that, that excites me and interests me. Retail, I mean, I've had people pitch to me return. I've had people come to me with healthcare, right? Unfortunately, I, I, I'm not the right person for that. And I say that very bluntly right at the very beginning. I am not the right person for healthcare. A, because it, you know, while there are a lot of challenges, you have to have some level of interest of wanting to make a difference. I just don't think I have that today. I, so retail is the same. I had somebody who came up with some pretty good garments for this segment of market, et cetera. I just have no interest a, B, I am not capable of understanding that fashion sense or anything like that. That's not me. Mm -hmm. right, so I'm taking on something that will, I'm setting myself for failure. So retail is not, is not something I can, I can win. Yeah, go ahead. At what stage do you expect uh, uh, entrepreneur to come to you for investment? It could be at the stage where I have this cool algorithm, which, you know, uh, applies, I think, to ABC. Typically, venture capitalists will not fund it at that stage. I think I have an example here, Krishna. I'm going to pick you as an example. He was a key architect at Violin, came to me with a great idea on virtualization. We didn't know exactly where to apply it. The first six months was spent on applying it, defining the market. and. I think he put up with me, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and I think we have created something of big value. He's created something which is absolutely phenomenal. So I think if you had gone to a traditional VC at that stage, it's a tough one to, to get funded. Go ahead, the last one. Yeah. Hey Rajiv, um, my short question is, uh, how do you, get time to sleep at night that and the longer question is uh like how do you decide how to allocate your time amongst all your various uh active investments because and he's got a lot of roses to smell <laughs> but yeah so uh you know uh family both my kids are, are now out of the house and my wife wants me out of the house as much as possible. <laughs> so 18 hours is cool. <laughs> Please get out. <laughs> so, I mean, she can't have me that long anyway. But irrespective of that, the decision on where to allocate is based on how much the company needs as far as I'm observing. For example, Reflection now, they are hitting very big numbers. If they need any help in getting an intro to some company and I can find someone, I, I do help in that fashion. But I, I mean, I, I ran that for a while. 
I'm not spending the kind of resources on that. I said that same thing about VPS. I think we are at a point where it's a very complex infrastructure software that Robin Systems is delivering, for example. I think I can add value in that space, and we are, we are trying to get it launched. We have the customers. I am spending a lot of time with the team because I think you know the value prospects of what we can deliver with it is just phenomenal. Right, and that's, and so it's 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 based on that that I'm spending a lot of time. Okay. Last question. You just told us that a little while ago what you're not interested in, what areas you're not interested in. Can you very specifically and very concrete tell us one, two, three, what areas you are interested in? Very interested in the backend side of what happens on the IoT and the massive amount of data that is coming in. The back side of it, not the actual device itself, the software side of it, very, very interested in that. I'm extremely interested in data, infra cloud infrastructure, and mobile, especially the related to the analytics pieces of things in that, analytics, prediction, machine learning side of things. Okay, let's give a big round of applause to that.